Do you get a good view of the screen? Yeah, I do, I do. It's good. I guess if I do this, you probably won't see it. Yeah, let's try that. <laughs> no, it's too... Yeah, that's too dark. I think this is good. Okay. Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to GSS. Today we have our second speaker of the semester, my dear office mate and roommate, Clyde Newstead. Um, yeah. Just because you are here is the excitement. Oh, I see. Um, so uh, he's going to tell us about something about computers and how to prove things. Um, okay. The stage is yours. Maybe. Cool. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, son. Um, okay, so my talk is entitled Formalization or Why I Stern to, or How, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Computer, which is a pun on the film Dr. Strangelove, which is called Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. So uh, in this case, the computer is the bomb, and so I guess we'll, we'll see what I mean by that. So <clears throat> what I'll be talking about today is why we might want to use computers to do mathematics. And when I, when I say do mathematics, I mean do the kind of math that we do. So proving stuff, not like um, you know using Wolfram Alpha to factorize a polynomial, but uh, actually proving stuff using a computer. I will then talk about interactive theorem provers, which is the main you know kind of thing that I'm hoping to talk about. Um, of course, when you're using a computer to do math, you need to worry about whether the computer is actually doing what it's supposed to do, and uh, and also how you expect to be able to translate your mathematics into the programming language of a computer or something, and so we have to talk about some of the foundational issues um, that arise if we want to keep using our normal foundations or if we want to switch to something else. I'll then do a demo, and I have no idea how well the demo is going to go, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. Um, this is using an interactive theorem prover called Lean, which I'll talk about more soon. And then I'll talk about some considerations for the future, um, things that may or may not go wrong or right in the future, and things that are currently working and not working. Like but before I get started, um, can anyone tell me what they think a proof is? Something concept students do badly. Something concept <laughs> students do badly. It's something that concept students do badly at the beginning of concepts, and something they do a little bit better at the end of concepts. Anything else? What is the thing that they're trying to do? Come on, we, we literally do this all day, every day. So hopefully we know what we're doing. Andy? Um, you start with some assumptions and inference rules, and you want to build uh, a sentence out of those assumptions and inference rules. OK, so start with some basic assumptions, axioms, build up a bunch of theorems based on yeah, building the things up and ending with whatever you're trying to prove. Sure. Greg? Uh, create a sequence of well-formed formulas without worrying about what they mean. Wow, a sequence of well-formed formulas. <laughs> yep. Any other slightly more human answers? <laughs> Pretty sure that's not what concept students do. They don't write down a well-formed formula followed by a well-formed formula. <laughs> if they do that, you, kind of, you take some points off, don't you? You, uh, you? I mean, often concept students write down ill-formed formulae, but they're not just writing down formulae. They're doing other stuff. I don't know. So. I'll start giving you some other answers now. Uh, you know, I'm sure that when you're in your office doing your research, you're not writing down well-formed formula after well-formed formula. formula. So <clears throat> one thing might be an argument that convinces yourself that the proposition P that you're trying to prove is correct. Um, that's a step. That might not be satisfactory, because you might want to convince others that P is correct, because otherwise <laughs> you're just kind of speaking to yourself. Um, so an argument that convinces others that P is correct is already getting fairly complicated because who are others? You've got to con consider like who you're writing your proof for or who are you you know giving a talk to that kind of thing. You know how much detail will you, will you need to go into for them to be convinced, etc. Um, the answer that Andy and Greg gave is a logically coherent sequence of statements beginning with axioms or known results and ending with the thing that you're trying to prove. Um, so this is more of a sort of formal perspective. And the stuff that I'll be talking about really falls more under this viewpoint of what a proof is. And there is sort of ongoing future work by people much cleverer than I am trying to go from num number three here to numbers like one and two 
based on one of these logically coherent sequences of statements, how can you get something that's human readable that other people might be able to read and actually understand and believe? It's possible that all of the above are concepts of proof and that something else entirely is the concept of a proof and it doesn't really matter what you think a proof is. Uh, the kind of proof that I'll be talking about really is this, this third kind of thing here. And so <clears throat> I'm going to make three observations about the state of the mathematical community and you know, where we are situated within the sciences right now. So the first observation I'm going to make is about the mathematical literature, so about the papers that we publish and the things that go in the archive and that kind of thing. And so most of what I'm going to say boils down to the fact that mathematicians are really human. Well, most of us, Poche and Lowe might not be. But, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so we make lots of errors, and those errors end up getting published. Um, and some of them are just typos, and some of them are things that like, oh, I made this false assumption, but if I correct it slightly, then it's something that I can fix. And sometimes it's something really fundamental, and you only discover that it's an error after 500 people have cited your paper. Um, we're lazy. We don't like to put all the details into our paper because they're too tedious to type out. Um, we make leaps of faith all the time. Uh, we expect our reader to fill in the details. And it's, it's difficult as well, given all the time pressure that we're under, to write a well-motivated mathematical paper with enough background that a reader can really understand it and whatever else. Um, we rely very heavily on our intuition. So, you know, when you start learning your field of mathematics, you get really bogged down in the details of like, oh, what's the actual definition of a pullback of two morphisms in a category, and you've got to check the universal property and do all this kind of stuff. But then after you've been doing that for a couple of years, you're like, oh, pullback, yeah, blah, 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 blah. You've kind of got this like post, uh, post complicated way of thinking about things, and so we rely very heavily on our intuition. And also, we really just have no idea what we're doing. Um, I think it was John von Neumann, or so, I think it was John von Neumann, said that you never really understand mathematics, you just get used to it. And I, I really feel when I look at my own research that this is the case. I have got used to it, and locally I understand what's going on, and then I try and think about how this translates to other areas of math, and I'm stumped. <laughs> uh, and so, a consequence of all of this is that we can't have full faith in the literature. And when I say the full faith, I mean like, what we're doing as mathematicians, we're supposed to be completely correct, you know, this is our like, in moral, moral superior intellectual high ground is like, mathematics is the purest of the sciences, we're doing what we want with complete certainty, except we're not, because we're throwing in errors, and we don't really understand what everyone else is doing, and, and so on. The second observation is that math is really hard, <laughs> really, really hard, uh, and this is something that I have certainly encountered during my PhD, and I'm sure that most of you are as well. Um, so it takes a long time for us to get to grips with the theory, which means that to even attempt to prove a theorem, we need to be able to understand the statement of the theorem, and even getting to the point where we fully understand the statement of a conjecture or something. It takes us years. That's why we spend the first two years of our PhDs taking classes. Um, proof techniques are never guaranteed to work, so you end up spending a long time cranking a handle, and then all of a sudden, like, it just doesn't work. Um, lots of what we do is very tedious, and I'm sure this differs from field to field, but I've definitely seen some analysts with long strings of integrals and all sorts of, you know, differential equations and whatever else. And then I personally, in my own research, had to give up a proof, just give up even trying to do a proof, because the details were just so tedious and annoying that I just couldn't even, I just didn't have enough time to write down all the details. Um, and so we end up wasting a lot of time and effort, and we could be using our brains for things other than, you know, cranking a handle and doing all these computational steps. So another observation is that we're not very good at speaking to each other, and we're even worse at speaking to people that are not mathematicians. And what I mean by this is that there are very, there's very little communication between fields. Um, Sun, who introduced me a few minutes ago, and I share an office and an apartment, and I have no idea what he does, and he has no idea what I do, and yet we're at the same PhD program in the same university, and that's just because I do logic and category theory, and he does analysis and PDEs, <coughs> and we just don't know, we don't know the words, we don't know the language. Um, it's often difficult to tell if something's already been proved. And so, you know, if you have a diligent advisor that's very knowledgeable in the literature and they've really read sort of everything and they're 90 years old and whatever else, then they might have some idea if someone's already proved the thing that you're trying to prove. But it happens a lot that you prove something and you find out that someone's already done it and it's in this paper that was published in 1983 or something like that. Um, it's very difficult to read papers in other areas. and so. You know, I've encountered times in my own research where I've had to delve into papers that are more close to like algebraic topology than they are to logic, 
um, or the more close to algebraic geometry than the author logic, and just the basic concepts of those fields are already so difficult to grasp that when it comes to reading a research paper, you're just doomed. Like, you, it takes weeks to read a single paper. Um, and we alienate non-mathematicians. It's not that we try to, uh, we just do. You know, it's difficult enough for us who have our undergraduate degrees in mathematics to read other math papers. How are people in stats trying to learn about algebraic topology to do persistent homology supposed to kind of get their foot in the door of algebraic topology? It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And so we end up with a very isolated community and a very disjointed community. So we're separated from the world and we're separated from each other, intellectually speaking. Um, and th <laughs> this is a problem. I mean, this is, this really is a problem. And it's, you know, part of the reason why I guess governments try to encourage like interdisciplinary collaboration and whatever, but it, we, it's something that we really need to address in the long run, even if not in the near future. Um, and so the idea is that we might be able to get some help from computers in solving some of these problems. And so the first of the problems in terms of making errors and filling in the gaps, the hope might be that we can use computers to verify the correctness. Um, if we have a sequence, you know, like we're saying, a proof should be a sequence of valid formulas that follow from basic assumptions to conclusions. A computer should be able to check if all of those, you know, steps that we're doing in our proofs are actually valid. Um, they should be able to assist with the process of proving a result. So this is kind of helping with the difficulty of doing mathematics. If a computer has access to all theorems of mathematics and you need to fill in a gap somewhere in your proof, it's going to find it a lot easier as a computer to just scan the whole database and fill in the gap with whatever theorem, you know, like a jigsaw fits in there, than it is for you to go and read decades worth of papers and try to find the missing theorem. Um, and they can provide extensive databases. And so once we've got all of our math into a computer, it should theoretically be possible to have searchable libraries where if you're presented with an equation that you don't know the form of, for example, you could type it in and it'll come up and say, oh, look, that's Pell's equation or something. Um, and then you can look at all the results that relate to that kind of equation and so on. It just makes navigating the literature a lot more easy. Um, and so hopefully uh, computers might be able to do this. Of course, I have to say this is just in theory because um, doing this, is, it's not like this is going to be easy right, to do all of this stuff. Um, so anyway, so that's all the motivation I wanted to give. So are there, any, are there any questions about why I care about this before we get started talking about it? So, do you care about unemployment? Do I care about unemployment? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to get to that later. Okay. So, yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, yeah, unemployment is something that we do have to worry about. Any other questions? So I'll talk about interactive theorem proofers. These are also called proof assistants. Um, and I guess I'll tell you what they are. So an interactive theorem prover is a type of computer program, and it consists of a few different components. One of them, you need to have some underlying logical system. This provides you with the language that you need to translate your math into something that you're going to put into a computer. And it tells you what the steps of deduction are valid. It's what allows you to build all of your formulas and your theorems and define your, your definitions and whatever else. Um, it has a trusted kernel. And so ideally, so this is going to be the main part of the program. It should be very, very small, because a smaller, the smaller a program it, it is, the more like convinced you can be that it's actually correct. And the kernel is going to be the thing that actually does all of the verifying that the things are correct. It will have an elaborator, which is some kind of addition to the kernel. And this is what's going to be able to tell you how to prove stuff. And so you start writing down the proof when you're stuck. And then you <coughs> ask your computer, how do I keep going? And the elaborator is what, what's going to tell you what you need to do next. Um, it's at least going to tell you what you should be trying to do next. And it should hopefully also be able to suggest some steps to get towards that process of doing that thing. Um, and it will have one or possibly several libraries, and the libraries are the, uh, the places where you can access all of the definitions that you've made and the results that you've proved, and so on. So this is kind of what an interactive theorem prover consists of. I'm not really going to refer to all of these things specifically uh, anymore in the talk. I just wanted to give you some idea. Um, but these are not new. These things have been around for a long, long time. They've been around for decades. And there are some examples. Um, Koch is a very big one. Agda, Hall stands for higher order logic, and is a very popular one. So it's Isabel, New Pearl. These are all classic examples of, um, of proof assistants that have all been around for a reasonably long period of time. They have established mathematical databases. Um, Koch, especially, and Agda, and yeah, I mean, these first few 
have very substantial mathematical libraries. There's a lot of math that has already been put in, in these proof assistants. And lean, the one that I bolded at the end, is the one that I'm going to be demonstrating later. Um, it was born a few years ago. It's being developed by Microsoft Research. And a lot of the work being done with the Lean Proof Assistant is happening in PISPO. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but just to give you some idea of what a proof in one of these proof assistants look like, uh, here is a proof that the square root of 2 is irrational in the proof assistant Isabel. And so you can see it looks a lot like, you don't need to read it all, you can see it looks a lot like some sort of hybrid between writing down a proof. You see lots of, you know, hences and like with this we have this and you know QED and thus and you know using this result and whatever else. It looks a bit like we're writing a proof, but it also looks a lot like a programming language. We have you know it's in monospace font and everything is like highlighted in different colors and it's set out on different lines and you kind of got this very like linear structure to the whole proof. Um, and the idea of what's going on here is you sort of state a theorem, you give the theorem a name, here, square root 2, not rational, and then you state the theorem, which says the square root of 2 considered as a real number is not an element of Q, the rational numbers. And then you start your proof, and then this is where the interaction between you and the computer begins. You might say, like, let x be one of these things, and assume that x is rational, and then somehow we're going to obtain a contradiction, that's down here, thus false using odd one by blast, which sounds pretty epic. So, <laughs> the, so when you assume that the square root of two is rational, what you end up deducing is that two divides one, that's what this step means. But then up here, uh, I guess somewhere in the library, so it's not stated here, but somewhere in your library you have a result called odd one, which tells you that the number one is odd. And so you're saying thus false using odd one by blast, and so BLAST will be some kind of what we call a tactic, which the elaborator uses. So the elaborator will look at odd one, it will look at BLAST and say, I need to find something that contradicts odd one. It will find this statement here that two divides one, and then bang, outcome's false. And then QED, because you've proved your contradiction. So <clears throat> this is just kind of one example of what a proof in a proof system might look like. Um, and as you can see, it's the kind of thing that like, getting to grips with these things is going to be pretty difficult. And so I'll be talking slightly more about that later as well. Um, but there are lots of big results that have been verified in various proof, assistant, proof assistants. So one of them, in 2005, um, Werner and Gontier proved, well, published their proof of the four-color theorem using Cox. So the four-color theorem was proved using the help of a computer originally but not using a proof assistant. The proof wasn't formalized. They used a computer to check like thousands of cases in this thing, right? And one of the big problems that came out when they published this proof originally was that like, well, you've just reduced the problem of proving a theorem to trusting the correctness of an entire computer program. And like, how can you really do that? Um, and so it took them until 2005 to actually formalize this within COG. So now the proof of the four-color theorem has been, you know, has a stamp of approval from a proof assistant. Um, one of them, Dirichlet's theorem. So this is the one about every arithmetic progression where the, the number you start with and the distance a co-prime contains infinitely many primes. So this was uh, formalized in Hall Lights, which is a variant of the high order logic <laughs> theorem prover um, by John Harrison in 2010. The Fight Thompson theorem. So this is the one that says that every finite group of odd order is soluble and is a key component <coughs> in the, um, the classification theorem for finite simple groups. That was, uh, you know, that proof, formalized proof was published by Georges Gontier in 2012. Um, the Kepler conjecture, so this is the result that says that if you have a bunch of oranges and you want to stack them up in the most space efficient way possible, then you're gonna like build a pyramid out of them, essentially. Um, so the Kepler conjecture is something that Tom Hales, who is a professor just down the street at the University of Pittsburgh, he proved this in, I think the 90s? Um, but the proof was so long, it was hundreds of pages, that the referees gave up. They stopped trying to check the results were correct because it was so long and so involved and so crazy that they allowed it to be published, but their comments were along the lines of, like, we sort of believe the essential correctness of this proof and whatever else. And it was like, yeah, you know, this had been a big conjecture for a long time. It's the kind of thing you want to be pretty sure about before you publish it and get your name uh, put on the paper. And so what Tom Hales did after he proved this was he decided to formalize it. And so he and a massive group of people, including some former students of CMU, 
Um, he also partners with the University of Vietnam, interestingly. So lots of the co-authors on this paper are Vietnamese. Um, so they, they formalized it. And along the way, they found hundreds and hundreds of errors in the original proof. <laughs> and of course, they had to correct them. And correct them they did. And in 2014 or 2015, they, well, in 2014, they announced the proof. 2015, they published it. And so that was like one of the big, big steps. He gave a talk over a pit. I went. It was very epic. Um, <laughs> And Green's theorem, so I don't want to bore the analysts here, but Green's theorem is a theorem of mathematical analysis and had not been proved for a very long time um, until a couple of Australians proved it in Isabel uh, two years ago in 2016. So these, these theorems are all things that are like, you know, these four especially are like big, difficult results. Green's theorem is something that involves lots of integral mathematical analysis, partial derivatives, triple integrals, double integrals, whatever, whatever you've got going. Um, but now we have these formalized proofs, uh, but there are many results still up for grabs. And so if you want to formalize Fermat's last theorem, for example, that's still up for grabs. If you want to formalize the independence of the continuum hypothesis, that's still up for grabs. Um, it, the independence of the continuum hypothesis sounds like it should be within reach. So um, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm talking about, though. So like, it might be very, very difficult. But I, I feel like it should be within reach. Um, so there are loads and loads and loads of results still up for grabs, and anything that you publish in your, you know, thesis hopefully is not already a known result, right? And then, so that's all up for grabs, so you can, you can formalize whatever you want. So do referees read these um, proofs written in the computer language? So are there referees? I believe so, yeah. So when they publish these results in journals, which they do, they publish papers that say how it work and how it works and like all of the code that they have. But the point is that all of these proofs are using these proof assistants. And these proof assistants have these trusted kernels, which are very, very, very small. And so, you know, there's one of them, I forget which one, that's so small that the developer of it, like in normal size font, made a t-shirt with the code for the kernel printed on it. <laughs> right? So it's a very small program. Um, and the point is that these, like, these small kernels will spit out errors if there is anything wrong in the proofs of these theorems. And so if you have stated the theorem accurately and the proof assistant doesn't spit out an error, then either your computer is broken, but you know, they check it on lots of different computers or whatever, um, or there's something wrong with the kernel, but the kernel is so small that you're convinced that there's nothing wrong with it. And so in some sense, like, these are much more trustable than 100-page proofs in journals that rely on hundreds of years of cumulative error-prone error papers. <laughs> um, but yes, they, they are refereed uh, before they get published. But I guess one of the hopes is that they may no longer need to be. So, but that's a different discussion. Um, and so to give you some idea of what's happening in Pittsburgh, um, there is lots happening at CMU and at Pitt. <coughs> and surprisingly, none of the, well, as far as I'm aware, none of the work being done at CMU is being done in the mathematics department. Um, and so the standard library of lean, so what I mean by standard library is just like standard classical mathematics, just results from math, number theory, combinatorics, like whatever you want, just you know, algebra, topology, like, they are being formalized in the philosophy department by, amongst others, Jeremy Avigard. He's a professor there. Rob Lewis actually graduated. Uh, he got his PhD like a few weeks ago. So he's disappeared now. He lives in Amsterdam. Um, and so the Lean Standard Library is being developed in the philosophy department. And it's surprising. Yeah, they're doing a lot of mathematics over there. Um, homotopy theory, or more accurately, synthetic homotopy theory, so sort of abstract homotopy and that kind of thing is being formalized by a group of people that are interested in homotopy type theory. Um, so Steve Awardy, who is my PhD advisor, although I'm not involved in this project myself. Um, Floris van Dorn, Egbert Riker, they're both PhD students, Jonas Fry and Felix Weller, they're both postdocs. So there is this group of like, essentially topologists and logicians that are working on like homotopy theory and formalizing it using lean. Um, and at Pitt, Oh, sorry, not quite there yet. In the computer science department, there's a group of people developing a new proof system called Red Pearl. <coughs> I don't know any of the details about this. Um, Red comes from a reference to communism because John Sterling is like a, an ardent communist and he's the one that, that initiated this thing, so that's where Red Pearl comes from. Um, 
So anyway, yeah, they're developing that, and they're also formalizing stuff in more classical proof assistance like Agda and Clark. Um, and then at Pitt, we have Tom Hale. So he's the one that proved the Kepler conjecture with stacking all the oranges. Um, obviously, he got very involved in, in formalization as a result of that. And he has started a project called Formal Abstracts in Mathematics. And this is using the Lean Proof Assistant, and there is a postdoc currently advertised at Pitt in exactly this. I think the deadline may have passed, so it's too late to apply. Uh, but there may be more in the future. Um, and the goal of this project is to formalize the definitions and all of the definitions and all of the statements of theorems in all published mathematical journals ever. So that's the goal. And their reason behind this, and not formalizing the proofs. And so there's no proof checking, it's just formalizing, getting the statements of all of the theorems down into a proof assistant. And the whole reason why they're doing this is because they want to make the mathematical literature more navigable and to be able to do things like if you stumble upon a thing and you're not familiar with that area, just go and like list all of the theorems about that thing that there are and pick the one that you want out and then find the reference to the literature that you can read more about it. So that's the goal of the Formal Abstracts in Mathematics project. Um, we'll see how that goes. I've seen some pretty convincing talks about it though, so uh, it's, uh, it's one to keep your eye open for. I imagine there will be some talks advertised at the pit like algebra combinatorics and geometry seminar or something like that, and so it's worth worth keeping that open for. Okay, so any questions before I start telling you a bit more mathematical nitty gritty? Yes. Um, are these languages like mutually intelligible to one another? Like, if I have a formal proof in one, can I port it to the other? Some of them, yes. So there are ways of porting between Koch and Agda. I know there are definitely ways of porting from one into another, um, but the problem with doing this is that the proofs in one, after you've ported them, become these just unrecognizable piles of junk. And so from a human readability point of view, the code that you obtain is correct, but human readably just not good. So if you go back to this whole, this proof in Isabel, of this, you know, the proof that square root of two is irrational, this is all computer code, but you can still sort of read it, right? If you were to port this into another language, it would slice and dice it so that it turns it into the language in whatever way it has to. It would reduce things to normal forms and it would expand terms and it would do all sorts of crazy stuff. And what you would end up with is like a pages and pages and pages long pile of gibberish. And like all of these names of variables like 2DVD and simp and whatever else, the names wouldn't be respected by the thing that's porting it. So while theoretically it's possible, it's not a nice thing to do by any means. I thought those things are going to be read by kernels anyways. Yeah. So but we want, to, we want the code to be readable to humans because we're making these mathematical libraries and if you want to be able to turn one of these code proofs into a written proof, you need to be able to understand it. Uh, to what extent are these languages, to what extent can you use them to just do regular programming? Uh, so any extent whatsoever, they're all Turing complete, so um, you, know, you might not want to, they're not the most practical languages ever. It would be like using a functional programming language like Haskell to do everything which some people do. I know, uh, you know there are people that do real programming using Haskell. Um, so you could theoretically in these do whatever you wanted. You could write an operating system, right? But you wouldn't want to. <laughs> okay. So, moving on, I'm gonna briefly but not very much talk about foundational issues. And so most formal mathematics, when I say formal, I refer to this whole process of writing down these sequential sort of logical proofs are done using zamela frankel set theory with the axiom of choice, with or without the axiom of choice, mostly with these days. Um, and some of these proof assistants do use set theory as their basis, so it's not impossible to use set theory. Um, but there are some challenges that you encounter when trying to get a computer to verify proofs that are written using set theory. And so one of them is, for example, consider this statement. Is this true or false? Uh, right. So this, so this says for every x, y, and z, whatever they may be, if you multiply x and y first and then z, that's equal to multiplying x to the y and z. It's saying you know associativity of multiplication, whatever this multiplication may be. Um, but then the problem is with this. I mean, for a start, like we don't have a bounded quantifier here, so we don't know what x, y, and z actually refer to. But like not only that, we don't know what this dot refers to. We don't know like what exactly is going on here. 
Um, and so if we knew, then we might be able to do something about this. But if you plug this into a uh, proof assistant in set theory, it's, n it's not going to know what to do um, unless you give it some more information. Um, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So another one is to consider this. So the, the binomial theorem is true in any commutative ring, right? So if you, you know, x plus y to the n, I have, I've left out all the, the, the quantifiers, but this is true for all x, y in whatever ring you're working in, all natural numbers x. So if you look at this statement, there's a lot kind of going on here that you might think is perfectly legit ring theoretically, and it is, but this like, this summation thing, like we're used to defining this over like numbers, like real numbers, for example, that you have to define this symbol here recursively over a ring, and you would need to do this every single time if you were gonna work with it. You have a natural number here, n 2 k, multiplying elements of a ring. But how do you multiply a natural number by elements of a ring? Well, you add the elements of the ring together, natural number, many times. Um, but then again, like every time you define a new ring, you're going to have to define this expression differently, potentially. <coughs> um, another thing is, what does 2 refer to? So if I write down 2, right, we all know what 2 is. Yeah? <laughs> OK. Now, in set theory, if I were to ask a, a zamello frankel set theorist what 2 is, or especially if they follow the von Neumann convention, what they will say is it's the set containing the empty set and the singleton containing the empty set. Right? So it's the set containing 0 and 1, and 0 is the empty set, and 1 is the singleton of the empty set. So if, but then that's not quite true, right? Because that's 2 as a natural number, but the integers are constructed as, as equivalence classes of pairs of natural <laughs> numbers. So if I want to write 2 and it refers to an integer, then what I have is not just a set with two elements, it's an equivalence class of pairs of sets with, you know, of, of natural numbers. If I want to consider 2 as a rational number, well, 2 is then an equivalence class of pairs of integers, so it's an equivalence class of pairs of equivalence <coughs> classes of pairs of natural numbers. If I want to consider 2 as a real number, then 2 is like a dedicate cut. So it's like a <laughs> downward close, like unbounded above, like blah, 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 like set of equivalence classes. So the number two, like when you write it down, if your proof assistant is using set theory, it doesn't know which set you're referring to. It could be any of these sets, and like, how are you encoding it? And so that has to be obvious somewhere. And so the, the key problem with this is that when we write stuff down in usual first order logic with, with set theory, like single sorted first order logic, so relative to set theory, the role of an object is not inherent to the object. So, you know, the number two considered as a natural number, empty set, singleton empty set, could be just, you could just want to be thinking about it as a set. And so two, on the one hand, you want to think about it as a number, but you can also think about it as a set. Um, and so, you know, the role of an object is not inherent to the object, but that means that when you're trying to use this object to prove stuff about other objects, it's less clear what to do with it when you're presented with it. And so the solution to this would be to use type theory. Uh, and in type theory, every thing, every object, which is called a term, like two, has a unique type. And so whenever you talk about two, you might say like two of type natural numbers. And in practice, you would not write this subscript. So the elaborator or the kernel of your proof assistant would know to interpret it in whichever way it needs to based on the context of what you're trying to do. I could consider two as an integer. Um, so this colon you can think of as being like an element hood relation, but we can think about it in other ways too. Um, there's the function which sends x to x squared, so the type of that is r arrow r. We still use this notation when we're doing set theory, but really this says this is a term and this is its type. r arrow r is the type of functions from the reals to the reals. Um, the natural numbers is a type, so it's a term of type, type, and so on. Um, don't ask me what type type has. It's like a whole thing of a cumulative hierarchy of universes and whatever else going on. Um, so everything has a unique type, but not only that. So whereas in set theory you have your logic underlying the set theory and then the set theory built on top, in type theory everything is just terms and types. There is no logical system distinct from the theory of types, they're just one and the same thing, which means that we can interpret the types as being propositions, things that we want to prove, and the terms as being proofs. <laughs> It doesn't make that much sense to think that two is a proof of the natural numbers, so we don't do this universally, but we're gonna have a special type called prop whose terms are types that we think of as propositions. So some examples of this. Um, so suppose you give me a, a proof of capital A, little a, 
and you give me a proof of capital B, little b. Right? So you've got a proof little a of big A and a proof little b of big B. How do you get a proof of A and B? Anyone teaching concept should hopefully know this answer. <laughs> just concatenate the proofs, right? So if I want to prove A and B, just prove A and prove B. So I obtain a proof of A and B by taking a proof of A and a proof of B. And so I just paste them together. And so in type theory, I could say A is a term of type A and B is a term of type B. Then this gives me a term AB of type A cross B. A cross B is the same as conjunction. And I'll go through more of these analogies momentarily. Um, and so you may notice that this is the same as the Cartesian product. So if you think about A, instead of being a proposition, as being the set of all proofs of that proposition, and B as being the set of all proofs of B, then A cross B is the set of all proofs of A and B. Right? Um, and so there's lots of analogies here. So A cross B, considered as a set, you think of it as the Cartesian product. Considered as a proposition, you think of it as conjunction. Um, we have coproduct, which gives you disjoint union in sets and disjunction as propositions which is to say something is an element of this set if it's an element of A or an element of B. To prove A or B, well, you prove A or you prove B, right? Um, a arrow B, so in set theory, it's the function set. Uh, as a proposition, it's implication. So as a function set, give me an element of A, I will give you an element of B. In proposition, give me a proof of A, I'll give you a proof of B, so A implies B, right? Um, so sigma and pi, so this is, index disjoint union, if you consider them as sets. So it's an element of one of these sets or one of these indices. Or you can think of it as existential quantification. So to prove there exists something, there exists an x such that b of x is true, find an x, that is, find one of these indices, and then find an element of the thing that it is referring to. And likewise with dependent products, uh, the elements of this thing are functions in set theory and the um, proofs for any x that b of x is true in type theory. And then terms, well, again, so ordered pairs correspond with pairs of proofs. Um, an element of A or B is a proof of A or it's a proof of B. I kind of said this already. So you get a proof of B from a proof of A, given any function like this. Um, and then likewise for the, these are called dependent types. The, so I won't go into this in too much more detail. But as you can see, this is kind of nice because you can use the same language for talking about things that you want to think of as sets and things that you want to think of as propositions without blinking an eyelid. And it's something that's really hard to get used to if you've been raised on set theory like I was. Um, and I still use set theory all the time. Uh, so I'm not going to pretend that this is how I think. Uh, but I think there's a really nice, nice way of doing mathematics. Um, and there are some advantages for you know, using this to prove your mathematical theorems. Because <clears throat> type theory mirrors programming. If you do programming, everything you do has a type. Uh, it might be a you know, type int, so it's an integer or a float, like a floating point, or it might be a list, or it might be you know, whatever. When you do programming, your things have types, and they behave in exactly this kind of way. Um, it's constructive, and don't worry, you can still do non-constructive mathematics within type theory. Uh, but the constructive character means that when you're building proofs, you're, it's easier to piece them together when you are able to construct, for example, witnesses of existence. So when you say there exists something that makes a thing true, if you can actually find the thing that makes it true, then that's going to simplify your proofs later on, provided you can do it. Um, and you can't always do it, and there are translations of non-constructive mathematics into this framework. Uh, a very sort of brute force approach is to double negate everything, and then you obtain a perfectly valid thing. Uh, but you don't need to do that. Um, it's proof relevant. And so what I mean by this is that when we're saying that a theorem is true, so when we're saying, for example, Sorry to do this. Say I'm saying that A is true, then I would say little a colon A. I don't just say A is true, I say here's a proof that A is true. So I'm keeping track of my proofs as I go, which means that when I'm pasting them together, I just need to find the proof and stick it in there wherever it's needed. So that's what proof relevance means. And it makes heavy use of induction and recursion. So whenever you declare a new type, it has some kind of induction principle and some kind of recursion principle. And these are precisely the things that computers need to be able to do computer stuff with them. Right, and so you do computer stuff. With them. So like, to do programming, these things are very important. Um, and so like, that's kind of nice. And if you were to translate most of what you do, most mathematicians, logicians are definitely not included in this. Uh, so I would definitely notice a shift. But most mathematicians wouldn't notice a detect in the foundational shift. So if you were to encode your mathematics using type theory rather than set theory, to you, like, you wouldn't really notice anything. 
because like how often do you refer to the axiom of foundation when you're doing analysis? Like you don't, right? You just do your stuff with functions and real numbers. You don't really care about how they're encoded as sets. Um, <laughs> and so most mathematicians wouldn't wouldn't detect a, a foundational shift. So, with no further ado, unless there's any questions, and please do ask some questions if you want them, I'm going to give you a little demo. Okay? Right, so the demo I'm going to give you is using lean, which is the proof of system that I was just telling you about. Do you see what they did with the E and the A? Ah, ah that's pretty clever. Um, so the Lean Theorem Prover, you can get it yourself, it's free to download, and it's free to use, and it's open source, and even though it's Microsoft Research, it's open source. Um, you can go to leanprover.github.io, um, if you really want to, you can even follow along with my demo. If you click documentation, then there's like a bunch of tutorials and whatever else. There was actually a class, where is it? Maybe it's not on here. There was a, a course at Carnegie Mellon which was in parallel with concepts, and it filled the same requirement. It was taught in the philosophy department, and they used Lean to formalize all the proofs that they did in that course, which I think is really cool. Anyway, there is an online version, or you can use Emacs, and I have not got used to Emacs yet, so I just use this online version. So I'm going to delete all of this, and I'm going to make it larger. So hopefully you can all see. You can read? OK, good. So. So let's talk about like, let's just prove some basic thing from like propositional logic, like day, like week two of concepts kind of proof. Okay. Right <laughs> so, so let let's have a look at this. So, let's start. We want to have some propositions to talk about, and so um, I'm going to introduce some constants. They're going to be propositions, and they're going to be called P, Q, and R. And so, if I want to find out the type of something, I do hashtag check. And then I'll get a message over here. So it tells me that P is a proposition, right? I can form new propositions from all propositions. So for example, I could do hashtag check P wedge Q. The nice thing about this is that you can use LaTeX commands, and the code actually accepts Unicode characters. And so you can read the code a lot more clearly with the Unicode characters. So you'll see here, look, P and Q is a proposition. So that's nice. Um, so what else do I want to do? Um, Say I want to have a proof of P, then I could like introduce one, and I could do like hashtag check P. And so what this says is that, um, oh, sorry, little p. So big P is a proposition, little p is of type P. I'm going to get rid of all of these checks because they're going to get in the way. Um, OK, so let's, let's prove a theorem about these things. Um, so the theorem that I want to prove is something like, uh, it's like conjunction is associative. So how about uh, con, doing the spacing backwards is really difficult. I can't, <laughs> I would normally mirror my screen, but when I did that, my laptop crashed, so I can't mirror the screen, which is really irritating. So I'm going to tilt myself slightly more. Okay, so I'm going to say conjunction is associative. And so this theorem has to have a type. Um, and the type is going to say, well, it's going to take in some arguments. So it's going to take in P, Q, and R as propositions. And the type of this thing is going to be, so it's the theorem that I want to prove, is that P and Q and R implies P and Q and R. I'm going to put sorry there for the moment. So, Sorry is what you write if you don't know how to prove something. <laughs> right, you apologize to the proof assistant. And then if you were to say, like, if you were to say check uh, conjunction is associative, then it will tell you that the type of this thing says for all propositions P, Q, and R, if P and Q and R is true, then P and Q and R is true. The fact that there's no parentheses here just means that it wants to associate the parentheses to the right, and it doesn't write them in that case. So let's prove this. And so, well, first of all, how are we going to prove this? Well, we want to assume that the thing before the arrow is true. So I'm going to do assume h. I'm going to go to a new line. If I write an underscore here, it'll tell me what I'm trying to do. So here, like above this little v dash symbol here, I now have h is a term of type p and q and r. 
and I want to get a term of type P and Q and R. Now the way I introduce a term of a new type is using what's called an introduction rule. And so I'm going to use this intro introduction rule, I'm going to give it a term of type P, and I'm going to give it a term of type Q and R. So the introduction rule, funnily enough, is called and.intro. And I'm going to do these things and put little underscores. So now it's going to give me some errors, which is fine. Um, so here you can see that like here 9, 8 means row 9, character 8. It's saying what it wants is a proof of P. And down here, line 12, character 8, it's saying what it wants is a proof of Q and R. So let's prove P. Well, I want to get P. I want to get something that proves P, and I have a proof that P and Q and R is true. So how do I get from P and Q and R to P? Well, if you know A and B are true, you know A is true. I'm going to do that twice. So the opposite of introduction is elimination. And so I'm going to do and.elim left. That's going to give me the first component. And I'm going to do the and.elim left h. So this says, give me the first component of h, and then give me the first component of that component. So this is saying, give me a proof of p and q, and then give me a proof of p. And you will notice that the error has disappeared. And so the only way that you know your proof is correct is that there's no error message, right? So you don't get any positive reinforcement from this thing. It's a lack of error message that gives you the satisfaction that you're correct. Um, can anyone guess how I'm going to give a proof of Q and R? Uh, as an intro. I'm going to do an and intro. And so the and intro, well, first of all, I'm going to have to give a proof of Q. Ugh. Doing this is very difficult. I'm going to have to give a proof of R. So you see here, I've left those dashes. Q, R. So now I need to give a proof of Q. I won't bore you with explaining everything anymore. So a proof of Q, well, I'm going to take the first, I'm going to take the proof of P and Q by doing the and elim left, and I'm going to do the proof of Q using and elim right. So here I get and dot elim right of and dot elim left H. You can see the error message for that thing went away. And so H, remember, is of type P and Q and R. And so if I do and dot elim right h, then away goes the error message. Okay? Now, this wasn't much fun, right? So there are ways of simplifying all of this, and there are ways of doing shortcuts, and there are ways, there are ways where you don't even need to type out all of this code. You just sort of, you would say, begin, and then you would write a bunch of commands to try stuff out, and then press end, and you could probably prove this in like two lines of code. Um, but I won't go into too much detail because I want to show you some other cool things that Lean can do. Um, so another thing that Lean can do, how about this? So we can give like inductive definitions of stuff. Um, so suppose I want to defile motion. Suppose I want to define a factorial function. So my definition of factorial is going to be a function from the naturals to the naturals. I'm going to define it using the fact that the natural numbers are defined inductively by saying that 0 is a natural number, and the successor of every natural number is a new natural number. Right? And so what I have to do to define a function from the naturals to the naturals is say what it does on 0. Well, the factorial of 0 is 1. And say what it does on successes. Well, the factorial of n plus 1 is n plus 1 times the factorial of n. Away goes the error messages. Right? And so you may notice that like, when I was halfway through doing this, I had errors. Once the error's gone away, what this tells you is that this really does define a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. So whereas up here, the error messages went away when it said, I have a proof of this proposition. Down here, it's saying, I have a function from the naturals to the naturals. But they're actually just the same thing. They're both saying, I have a term of the type you said I did. Um, and so you can check that this works by doing hashtag reduce, and I might want to find the factorial of 6, which should be... Oh, I should say, I've done reduce fac, and this is like what the computer actually does when it's computing these factorials. But, so if I do fac 6, 720. How about that? How about I want to do something a little bit more complicated? So suppose I want to define a binomial coefficient. So a binomial coefficient takes in two natural numbers and it spits out another natural number. 
Equivalently, it takes in a natural number, and then it takes in a natural number, and then it takes in a natural number. And so what I'm going to do now is tell you what it does when I give it 0 and 0, what it does when I give it n plus 1 and 0, what it does when I give it 0 and k plus 1, and what it does when I give it n plus 1 and k plus 1. So this is going to be an inductive definition of binomial coefficients. So what's 0 to 0? Anybody? 0. How many oh, zero one. element subsets of the empty set are there? One. one. Very good. <laughs> okay, n plus 1 to 0. How many zero element subsets of a set of size n plus 1 are there? One. one. How many <laughs> sets, how many uh, k plus 1 element subsets of the empty set are there? Zero. None. Okay, and in terms of smaller numbers, how many subsets of size k plus 1 are there of a set of size n plus 1? Anyone teaching concepts this semester? <laughs> Anyone remember the binomial thing? You go up in the graph, right? So it's, it's n choose k plus n choose k plus 1. Okay? And I'm going to introduce a notation. I'm going to write notation n choose k is binom, binom nk. And so now what I'm going to do is say hashtag reduce um, 5 choose 3, which should give me 10. Ta-da! It works. Yes? Wait, so I'm just trying to understand the, the types here. So, because I think of binomial as a function from n cross n to n. Yes. So, what, so what's going on here with this sort of like triple function? So when you write a triple like this, you're associating to the right. So this takes in a natural number, and it spits out a function from the natural to the natural. Okay. Yeah, and there's a bijection, a natural bijection, between such functions and functions that take in pairs. So taking in a pair in, is the same as spitting out a function. Yeah? When you do some kind of um, in, inductive or even recall recursive definition here, does it, does it do, does, the, does whatever lean is um, do anything to check whether it's a well-defined recursion or anything? Yeah. It will give you an error if it isn't. Ah. Yeah. And, and does this like a real time, as in if you, okay. yeah. yeah. Can you put the brackets in the first n? So if I do this, then what it will want me to do is take in a function and spit out a natural number. And you will notice I have errors because like, it was expecting to find something of this type and it got something else. So actually, the example here, the, the reason why this fails is like at the very beginning, at this zero here, it wants n arrow n to be a structure that has a notion of zero. And so actually, I, the next thing I'm going to do is define a structure. And has zero is a structure that says that your thing has a unit for an addition law. And so going back to that thing, you know, when I said, what does x times y times z equals whatever mean? So as soon as you know the types of x, y, and z, if, you've, if you know that your type has the structure of something like multiplication, then what your proof assistant is going to do is look through the library, find the proof that it has that multiplication, and then it will tell you what to do when you see the plus sign and the zero sign. But I'm going to take away those so I don't get any more error messages. So this is a GSS talk. And every GSS talk must contain a definition of a what? A graph. I continue to be disappointed by the lack of definitions of graphs that have been happening. And so I'm going to give you one now. Um, but first of all, I'm going to define a quiver. Everyone knows what a quiver is, right? It's a thing you put arrows in. It's a thing you put arrows in. Yes, I'm actually going to put two arrows in my quiver. <laughs> and what are the arrows I'm going to put in my quiver? Pointy. The pointy arrows. It's going to give you a source and a target. So a quiver is a directed multigraph with loops. <laughs> or put more simply, I'm going to be defining, let's get this right, did I delete this? No, I didn't. Good. So I'm going to define a structure. So this is a structure that you can put on a thing. I'm going to call the structure quiver, which I'm going to spell correctly. And so I'm defining a structure, so I do this thing. And to make my structure, what am I going to need? I'm going to need a type of vertices, a type of edges. I guess I don't need those spaces. And for each edge, 
I'm going to need a source vertex. And for each edge, I'm going to need a ugh, target vertex. You don't actually need these LaTeX things. I could have just done dash arrow, but it just looks nicer to do the LaTeX stuff, so I do it. <laughs> OK, so there's a quiver. That's how you define a quiver. Um, and so I could give you an example of a quiver. I'm not going to. Um, instead, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what a directed graph is. So what's a directed graph? It's a quiver without loops and multiple edges. It's a quiver. Yeah, so whether or not you want loops is, we could put it in, we, 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 we'll allow these to have loops. Um, so a directed graph is going to be a quiver where every edge has a unique source, where, sorry, where every pair of vertices has at most one edge going between them, right? So you can't have like, from this, arrow, from this blob to this blob, you can't have several edges going there. And so what I'm gonna say is that a directed graph is a quiver. And so I'm gonna say extends quiver. By doing extends, what I've just done is say, whenever I prove anything about a quiver, it's going to hold of a directed graph. It's going to hold of the underlying quiver of any directed graph that you give it. And so we're not duplicating our efforts. And this is very important for defining algebraic structures, for example. Um, OK, so in addition to having the structure of a quiver, it's going to have a proof that every pair of vertices has at most one edge between it. And so I'm going to say, let's get this right, Clive, because that'll be embarrassing if you don't. OK, so. Oh, I guess I should have a proof. So no duplicates is going to be a term of a type, which is a proof of a proposition. The proposition it's going to be a proof of is for all, say, E and F, I hate to call it F, but I will for, for now, of type edge, Q dot uh, sorry, Q dot, do I want edge? Yes. So for every edge of type Q, if the source of E is the source of F, and I really hope I don't get any error messages after this, and the target of E is the target of F, then E equals F. Now, what's going wrong? Yeah, what is Q here? So Q, ah, there we go. Maybe I just need an E. You're right, sorry. I was getting ahead of myself because I was going to actually define a quiver. There we go. OK, so a structure is a directed graph if it's a quiver and it has no duplicates, which means that I'm able to present it with a proof that for every pair of edges, E and F, if their sources are equal and their targets are equal, then the edges are equal. And finally, and there are definitely easier ways of defining graph, but I couldn't work out how to do it, so I did it this way instead. So now suppose I want to define a graph by extending a directed graph. How am I going to do it? Uh, no loops. No loops. Um. OK, so let's do no loops. No, no loops. So I guess this is going to say, for every edge, the source of E is not equal to the target of E. And symmetric. it's symmetric, right? A symmetric directed graph with no loops is the same as just a graph. And so symmetric is going to say, uh, for all, uh, Oh, I made a definition before that. OK. Before I do this, I'm going to make a quick definition. So I'm going to say goes to um, is going to take in a quiver. And it's going to say that a vertex u goes to a vertex v if, uh, so this is going to be a proposition. And it's going to be defined by saying, that there exists an edge whose source is u and whose target is v. That's a proposition. I guess there's something uh, wrong with it. Q dot v. I need q dot v over there. There we go. No error. 
And so now I can say, okay, so it's symmetric if for every pair of vertices, if u goes to v, then v goes to u. And I called them the wrong name. No, I didn't. What's wrong? Oh, no comma. Syntactical error. There we go. So it says for every pair of vertices u and v, if u goes to v, then v goes to u. So there's an edge from u to v, then there's an edge from v to u. OK? So anyway, I've defined a graph, so I feel happy with this talk. <laughs> and that concludes the demo. And so for the last couple of minutes, I'm not going to keep you for much longer. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about these programming languages. So there we go. OK. So considerations for the future, since the future is all that there is left in the world. So something's going well in the world of formalization. Um, one of them is that it is a fun thing to do. So I had fun. Maybe you didn't have fun watching me, but you could go home and you could download Lean and you could uh, play around with it. You could look at the manuals. The, the manuals are really good. And they have interactive manuals that have the textbook on one side and the same JavaScript thing on the right-hand panel. And you can follow along as you, as you read the manuals. So that's really cool. Um, there's lots of interest in theorem proving right now. Um, Theoretically, all of this stuff, you know, there's nothing special about mathematics that makes it verifiable. You can apply this to programming languages. You can verify the correctness of a program. You can even verify the correctness of hardware, the fact that it won't fail. Um, and so this is very crucial for things like medical technology, and they are used in those, in those fields, um, just with different logical systems, obviously, to be able to formulate the programs rather than mathematical proofs. Um, the technology is getting better and better every day. The speed that it takes to check a proof is correct gets smaller and that kind of thing. Um, and there are lots of non-mathematicians becoming interested in mathematics. So much so, like I said, that all of the formalization being done at CMU is not in the math department. So like that, you know, case in point. Um, and the libraries are getting bigger. So there are loads and loads and loads of theorems being formalized on a daily basis and put into publicly accessible, digitized, formalized, verified libraries, which is really cool. Um, things, some things are not going as well. And so the first one is, it's a very steep learning curve. Learning how to do this takes a long time. It takes at least, you know, a year. Probably. If you want to be able to do this fluently, it's gonna take you at least a year of just struggle before you get there. Um, it feels a lot like programming, which for some people is a bonus, but for me it is not, because I don't really enjoy programming as much as I enjoy proving stuff. Um, there's little consensus about anything. And so not just consensus about which theorem prover to use, but consensus about which foundational system used by which theorem prover is the right one to formulate mathematics in and yada, yada, yada. Um, additionally, there's not much money in it. So, you know, although these projects have gained interest in industry, compare this to something like automated, like, you know, driving, like, what do you call it? like driverless cars, like there is just not as much money in this stuff as there is in that, and so it's hard to invest the people power into this that's needed to develop the technology. Um, and on top of that, mathematics, mathematicians <laughs> are skeptics. And so, you know, I took a risk by giving you this talk, but hopefully I've convinced you at least a little bit of the worth of these things. But the mathematical community as a whole, especially the older, more curmudgeonly types, are never going to trust a computer over hundreds of years of mathematical papers because they just don't like technology and they trust people more than computers. <laughs> That's something that our generation finds odd, the fact that you would trust a person more than a computer to be correct. Um, but the older generations are the other way around. Um, and I guess just some considerations for the future, there's lots of issues coming our way. And so one of them is, is it really necessary to use a single foundation and a single theorem proven to prove everything? Or could it be that results in homotopy theory are proved in lean, and results in mathematical analysis are proved in Isabel, and results in combinatorics are proved in this other proof of system? And it's just a case of like you decide which theorem, which uh, branch of math you're in, and then go down that route. Um, user friendliness is something that could be vastly improved to the point where it would be nice to be able to write down a proof in grammatically correct English and have your computer interpret it formally. Right, and tell you where the gaps that need to be filled are and maybe do it for you. Um, the right level of interactivity is, so on the one hand there's no interactivity and that's kind of the proofs that I was doing, right? I was just writing every step myself. 
There are tools in Lean that I didn't even show you where Lean will just do those things for you and you won't have to write and.intro you know, and and.elim underscore left and all that kind of stuff. It just does it for you. Um, and so the question is, like, what's the right level? Clearly, no interactivity is not good because then it's still really difficult to formalize these things. Complete interactivity, which again is like no interactivity, but on the other end, is you type in a theorem, and if it's correct, it says yes, and if it isn't, it says no. And this then comes back to Sun's question about unemployment, like do we have to worry about computers taking our jobs, right? And so, uh, I don't know. That, I don't think about these things very much, um, perhaps I should, but I, uh, we're not there yet, so, you know, decades in the future, maybe we can worry about that. Um, you know, I, I still have hope that humans are the only people that are capable of finding out whether a mathematical result is interesting, whatever interesting means. I don't know. Um, if we are going to get more widespread use of these things, then it's going to have to be incorporated into the mathematical education. And so, like I was saying, Jeremy Avigad taught this philosophy course last... Actually, it was Jeremy combined with Florence Van Dorn and Rob Lewis, maybe. Maybe not Rob. I don't remember. It was Jeremy and a couple of other people. Um, they have already taught a course in this, and in fact, in I think the spring of 2015, there was a course in using Lean by Jeremy Avigad, and that's where I got um, that's where I got my first exposure to Lean from. Um, so it's being incorporated at CMU in the philosophy department. Maybe one day it will expand a little bit. Um, and the other thing is that these proofs, especially when you're using so-called tactics that do the proofs for you. Turning those into human readable proofs, things that you would actually read in a journal, is a challenge and can be done in basic cases, but not necessarily completely. So they're just things to keep in mind for the future. All right, that's everything. So thank you for listening. The slides are on my website. Any questions? Joe. How do you balance the, you know, um, amount that you understand about how to work on um, lead and maybe other things has actually been um, useful for what you're doing in your own research. Yeah. Theoretically, it would be. Um, so the reason I say that is because my a lot of my research concerns homotopy type theory, and pretty much everything that's done in homotopy type theory since its in like since its first inception has been formalized as a point of principle, and so like. There is this whole field where everything is formalized, and that's just like you publish a paper, and you you say like, and you can find the formalized version on this web, you know, this GitHub page or something. So in some sense, yes. In another sense, no. I work with um, high dimensional categories, doing semantics of homotopy type theory, and those structures just haven't been formalized yet, and there isn't a theory in Lean or in any other proof assistant to really talk about those things. And so while it would be worthwhile in the long run for me to formalize that. And that would have helped me get over the problem that I was talking about earlier, where I couldn't work out all the details of this proof. I could have had the proof assistant do it for me, but I would have to develop all of the theory first. And so, like, you know, if I had minions to do the hard work first, and then I crank the handle myself, and it'll be fine. But so, like, so yes in theory, but no in practice. Yes. Yeah, so, like, uh, I'm wondering how this like system handles my like, numerical error. So like for yeah, go on. So like um, for basic like numerical like analysis class, there's always a sort of, sort of thing for like plus minus plus minus and then something. Mm -hmm. um, instead of plus 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 and then minus minus minus, uh, which they're supposed to be the same, but they're not like right. numerically. Yeah, yeah. But, but how does the computer system get around? So with this, I would say that doesn't arise quite so much because you're normally proving higher level things. You're not, you know, whenever you define a quantity, you're defining it, you know, you define like a variable. You might use integers sometimes, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be doing calculations that involve real numbers to a high level of precision, for example, because there are already systems out there to do that. Theoretically, in the future, maybe you would, um, but how it actually handles it, I don't know. So lean. Is, so actually, one of the main drawbacks of Lean is that oops, it is written in C++, um, and C++, like its kernel is in C++. So to trust its kernel, you have to trust C++, and that language is ridiculously massive. So you can't really trust Lean's kernel in the same way that you can trust <coughs> other kernels, um, unless you trust Lean, C++. 
but I would imagine that it handles those errors in the same way that C++ would. But I could be wrong. And also, I know no computer science, and so I can't tell you any more than that. Andy? But so, how successful have this um, various theorem provers been tackling like more spatial topics, like point set topology? Like, if I want to formalize Uri sums lemma, <laughs> or um, something like that. I don't really know. So, synthetic homotopy theory is only a new application of this. Um, which is very much not point set because yeah, it's independent yeah. of the like the construction of the interval, for example. You know, abstract interval. You just need a thing with two endpoints. Like that's that's an interval. It doesn't have to be the real one. Um, so, I really don't know. I don't know. It strikes me as something that should be like not. It should have been done already in something like Isabel or Hull or Cock. They have some topology. I don't know exactly what they have, but they have some defaults and Ooh. some metric spaces and... Oh, do they? Yeah. I don't know exactly what they have. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs>